Hey guys, Anthony for Before Diesel. This video is all about why your engine's overheating or what you can do to help prevent it from overheating. So all the different aspects, the radiator, the cooling system, the thermostat, the fans, how they work and under what conditions the vehicle might overheat and why and how to prevent it. So there's going to be a whole heap of information. Now, um, you know my videos, they're not scripted. I don't make notes and plan it. It's just all in the head and it's butter, bing, butter, boom. So there's no better time than right now to hit subscribe and turn the bell on because what I miss in this video will be included in another video another time. That's the deal, right? So when we get text messages asking questions where I go, I get the same questions over and over again or I think we can help people by putting a video like this out there, um, that's when we get an idea for another video. Now, it's not just about this engine. So here we've got a Toyota Prado with a 1GD FTV engine. Most of our information is based on the 1KD FTV engine, but not those alone. Um, this is going to be a general uh, cooling system and overheating problem solving video um, that will relate to most vehicles because it's all very similar. They're an engine, they make heat, they've got a cooling system with a radiator, they've got a thermostat and they've got a, a fan of different types and that's the basics of it. So we're going to go through and run through the rolls and um, what they've all got to do, those, those items and where problems arise. Um, so not just Prado or 4x4 related, this is related to anything, but we're going to go and relate it back to the 1KD because that's what we see most of and most of you guys that follow us, um, that's one of the engines, it's, it's a popular one, it's probably one of the most popular engines out there. I believe there was something like nearly 3 million 1KDs built, so there you go. Alright, let's get on with it. Actually, just before we leave this vehicle, I just want to show you something that's really right here in front of us, how important it is. The cooling system and the way these manufacturers design the vehicle that grill that front grill there is massive okay that's around about i haven't measured it i'd say that's about 800 900 millimeters wide and it's around about nearly 300 high it's got these massive big openings in there right they are look you can fit a hand in there they're that big right why did they do that right because the vehicle needs air okay and here this setup here without a bull bar is absolutely massive. It's getting all that airflow into the engine bay, both sides. And there's also, actually, there's another vent down low here. So you've even got, I call it a vent, it's probably the wrong term, but it's another opening there to let air in. So, you know, that's how important it is. It was worth putting another one down lower. So let's take special note of how massive that amount of airflow is going through there. And then the next point to that, if you look in there, and I haven't got a light handy at the moment because I didn't plan to do this. I said I'll make it up as I go. I don't know if you can see it, but you can probably look on your own vehicle or another vehicle. Go and look in a car yard or one of your vehicles that hasn't got a bull bar and it hasn't been messed with yet. There's actually some ducks, and I've shown them in another video. So that's why it's important to subscribe and watch the other videos because all the information, it all sort of interlinks in the end. There's plastic shrouds in there that channel the air that goes into this grill directly to those items that need to be cooled down and there's three there you've got your air conditioning condenser you've got your intercooler for your intake system you know the turbo and the intake system and you've got your radiator so there's three items there and there's a thermo fan in there but let's go and have a look at the 1kd and get on with those components and what their role is okay so what's happened here we haven't got to explaining the system yet, but I just want to show you. Oh no, what's happened here? Well, not much airflow left. Let's have a look at this, right? So from the start on a 120, for example, you've got the grill there where an amount of that is taken up into the bonnet for the intercooler. See that, those ducts there at the top of the grill at each side, right? So that doesn't go to the engine bay and it's a much smaller grill to start off with. So. At this point, I'm just trying to point out how important it is to get some air in there. Okay, now, so we've got the limited amount of grill space there already, and then we've put a light bar in the way to block some of that airflow. So if you look at it, to, to the left of the light bar, there's a little bit of airflow. Then you've got that duct up in the top corner there. A little bit of airflow above it, yep. But towards the top, the top half of that opening with the Toyota badge there, is the cross member, the part that comes across the top of the radiator support panel and a lot of that air goes up and it just hits the seal on the outside so that doesn't really get in there. Then at the right side you've got that duct again and then of course going down you've got the light bar. Now 
don't get me wrong, there's some air going to get in there, but not a lot. So then, look, so I don't think this design bull bar is the best, but look, what, you can see it's an ARB bull bar. What they've done, they've put a slot in there for some air to go through there. So, that, okay, that's good, I like that. But then where do you mount your number plate? There's not a lot of places to mount the number plate. That's not really well designed either. If you go any lower, when you do a water crossing, the water gets in behind it and bends it upwards anyway. If you go higher, you can't go any higher than that. So that's about the only flat place you can mount a number plate. So that's blocking 50% at least of that airflow that was going where that slot is cut in there, okay? Then some people have got a winch in behind there. So certainly not a lot of airflow. I'd suggest we need a lot more airflow for a start. And um, let's have a look underneath here. I think there's an opportunity here Right, see that black plate there? I'm not sure if kaon has got something. I did mention it a little while ago. That black plate there could be redesigned and have some air direction funneling the air up to the cooling system. That would be awesome. So we need to find out more about that. That's not what this video is about. We're going to get on with the cooling system operation, but straight away we're at a disadvantage because there's no airflow going into that engine bay. And we need a lot more than that, okay? Now don't get me wrong, it'll do the job and most cars aren't going to overheat, but they're not going to be as cool. The parts that it was designed to get cool aren't going to be getting cooled and they're going to be running a little bit warmer, particularly when you get into the hotter weather. When you've got hotter weather, you're towing, that's where they're going to be at a massive disadvantage where you need this cooling system to be working in optimum condition. Now let's talk about why and what the roles are. Alright, cooling system 101. I don't know, I think it's the term of the week. I did something like this not long ago, 101. What is 101? 101 reasons to... I think it's something along those lines. Well, this isn't 101. It's kind of like people use it as a basics. It's not 101. Anyway, who cares? <laughs> Hope you know what I mean. Like I said, it's not scripted. I just make it up as I go. It's just all in the, it's all in the brain and it's just going to come out. So, by the way, filthy engine bay here. Needs a bit of a clean up. No, it's not too bad. It's just been used. A bit dusty, a bit of water. Okay, so cooling system. Okay, the main components of your cooling system are, your probably number one is your radiator. And I think hopefully everyone should know what a radiator is. That's located underneath his trim here. Okay, there's the top of the radiator. And it runs all the way across. And it's similar in most vehicles. It's at the front because it's got to capture that airflow. And we've got a fair idea that at the front is best, okay? And that will be the shortest distance for the coolant to travel as well because it connects on the front of the engine. So there's a couple of things to take into account. The distance to the radio, the connections, the hoses, and of course the best airflow and the size of it. Now, this is a Prado 120, um, 1K DFTV engine, and the height of the radiator, it's full height. Okay, I again, I haven't got measurements. Let's just take a guess. It's probably 600 mil high, something like that, about the same width as well. We're just going ballpark. I'm not into the specification of the radiator. It's all good. Right, so if you were to take this trim off, you'd be able to see more detail. Radiator here, and you've got the aircon condenser in front of it. That's what this is down here. We'll just have a look and see what you can see. We'll just go down there a little bit so you can hopefully see what's going on. This is your, not your radiator. This is your condenser for your aircon. That's another video, and we can explain all the components of the air conditioning or co uh, the you know not the cooling system it's not the cooling it's the u cooling system or the me cooling system because we want to be cool too that's another video guys so be aware this is not your radiator okay we've done other videos showing you how to clean some of the debris without taking it all out of course taking it out does get it clean better but you don't want to be doing that every year probably every five years or something like that it's worth doing depending how you use the vehicle if you use it just to go to the shops and back you're not going to get a lot of debris in there if you do outback trips bugs and um, dirt and dust and mud holes and all that they're the things that need to be cleaned out so basic components the major component of your cooling system is the radiator its job is to cool the coolant or water whatever it is the fluid let's use the word fluids probably better to cool the fluid that runs through it we'll get to why and where it's coming from and why it's hot so its job is to do that the way it works is obviously the coolant comes in um, there's a tank on each end so there's a these days is a plastic tank on each end and it's usually an alloy radiator okay and there's an o-ring in behind there and there's all these little tabs that are bent around that fix that plastic tank onto there okay don't worry about pulling it apart these days you know it's just replace you know what i mean it's not even worth it by the time they do all the work clean it australian labor prices you just get a new radiator these generally don't leak if they do a bit of a slow leak at the bottom again that's in the other video so radiator okay it's jobs to cool down the coolant okay 
So it runs through the radiator in the radiator in these little what we call it. It's not fins because the fins are what go in between, like tubes. Okay, they're tubes and they're probably around about an opening of about let's say two millimeters. Again, I haven't me me uh, haven't measured it. I'm just going off the top of my head from what I see. They're about two millimeters by about. They could be 10 millimeters wide, 15. They can be even longer. You know, you can get big, thick radiators. You know, you get into trucks even bigger and all that. We're not going there. We're talking about passenger car averages here, right? So the coolant flows through these tubes across the radiator. Okay, the air flows over the tubes, right? This way in the front where we showed you where it comes in. And as the air passes over those tubes, the coolant in there might be say, let's just use 90 degrees. Right, and as the air passes over, well, if the air is 10 degrees, it's going to knock quite a bit of heat out, isn't it? And if the air is 45 degrees, it's not going to knock out anywhere near as much, which is what I'm trying to point out. You need it working at its maximum, right? Because when the air is 45 degrees and the coolant's 90 plus degrees on these engines, up to 90 is considered normal, over 90 is getting warm. And you, you, I'm going to follow on with all the reasons why, okay? Now there's all these little fins, I don't know if you can see this one down here, um, I'll just grab another light quickly, I don't know, but there is what I would call fins in between the tubes, okay, now I'm not a radiator specialist or anything, but so there, there are your tubes there, this is the condenser remember, but similar setup, these are smaller though, there are your tubes and there's little fins in between, so the air can go in between, it's heat transfer right, so then the air cools down these little fins which it, it you know it's all connected to the tubes you know just like you use your brakes your brakes get hot and then it goes into the caliper and it goes into the brake lines and the brake fluid and so on all right so heat transfer so that, i hope you get the basics that's the job of the radiator to cool down the fluid and you probably a lot of people sitting there going yeah yeah we know that get on with it well just like i've said before there's some people that have got no idea we're catering for everyone here so please be patient so your radiator that cools it down now where does the heat come from well the heat comes from the engine that's another video, um, you know, your engine, it's got lots of little explosions going on in it, whether it's a petrol or a diesel. Diesels do generate more heat because it's the heat of combustion that causes combustion, okay? So understand they do make more heat. So it's even more important in a diesel to not upset the design of the cooling system, as has kind of been upset here with the bull bar. There's no direction here for this air as well. When it comes in from here behind this bull bar through that through that little gap that's left there each side of the number plate it could just go sideways and out under the headlight instead of it's not directed it's not channeled into this cooling system like it is on a lot of vehicles this has been going on for decades okay we see vehicles come out they slowly change the design to make it look good and then they have cooling problems and that changes again to have this big opening in the front of the vehicles you have a look around a lot of these cars i'm going to use the fords as an example in the last 10 years you know like the, the last of the FGs, they really open up the front there. And when you look at the design of all the other ones, I don't even know the names of the makes and models or whatever. I'm not going to go into that. But you'll see this really big opening, big flat grill. That's because they know they need all that air cooling to go through there to cool all these systems down. Not just the radiator, but the air over the engine also, right? The air is a lot of cooling. Besides water cooled the engine. But So anyway, back to the engine. So the engine's making the heat, right? So there's cylinders in there bang 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 making lots of explosions making a whole heap of heat no cylinders are surrounded by coolant or water we're just going to use fluid i'll say coolant water or fluid you know what i mean for the terms you know the terms kind of thing you know where you look it up so the fluid whatever it may be is getting hot okay so it needs to flow that's why you've got a water pump in place the water pumps generally on the front of the engine again it's in other videos we've talked about that most people know what i'm talking about the water pumps the fluid around okay now We've also got a thermostat, okay? Generally, you know what a thermostat. In this case, in an engine, a thermostat, it is kind of like a blocking plate, and it opens up when it gets to a certain temperature. In these engines right here, and probably the 1GD is about the same, these are 83 degrees, these thermostats, and the cooling system works really well at idle. These pretty well always idle on 83 degrees. If it doesn't, you've got a problem, that's when you probably need a new thermostat. Now I'm going to give you a lot of probably maybes and general information. I'm not here working on diagnosing your car right now, so it may vary. But if you've got a 1K FTV, everyone I've ever seen in normal working condition idles at 83 degrees. That doesn't mean you've been on a heavy drive, you come back to idle and straight away, it's on 83. It's going to take a little while to come down. But if everything's working normal, it's going to be come down to 83. Okay. When you're driving, in average conditions, it's going to be around 85, 86 
that's about as much as you should need to see if your cooling system's working pretty well. When you start working it up hills and towing, you're gonna easily see stuff like 90. I suggest anything from 90 onwards, you just back off and take it easy because up 75 to 90 is considered normal operating temperature, okay? Thermostat's right in the middle, 83. So the thermostat's job is to control the flow because we don't want to run around with a cold engine or transmission. All these things are designed to run at, you know, ideal operating temperatures. And in this case, it is 83 degrees, 75 to 90 degrees on this engine. Very similar with all your other diesel engines, okay? Um, so we've got the engine making heat, we've got the radiator wanting to cool it down, that's good. And we've got the water pump pumping it along and we've got the thermostat controlling the flow. Now, some people in the old days, they go, oh, it's, it's overheating, you know. Old cars were different, right? The cooling systems were average at best. All the materials, the quality of everything, oh, it was rubbish, mate, you know. Rust and everything all the time, and then things cake up with rust. We'll get to that. That doesn't happen with these, but we'll get to that. It's all part of the video, unless I forget. And that's why I said subscribe, because you'll get it in the next one, in case we miss it in this one. Go back and watch all the other videos. So the thermostat's controlling the flow. So it's going to stay closed until the engine gets to 83. So... All those little explosions, bang, bang, bangs going on in the engine and it's warming up, right? That's why your heater doesn't work yet. Your heater works from the heat of the engine. So when you get in your car and you start up, why's your heater not working? It ain't gonna work until you get, you're gonna slowly start to get heat as the engine warms up, you know? When on the 120, for example, when the needle gets to the bottom of the normal, the, that line at the bottom there near the cold, that's around about 50 degrees. Once you get to there, you're gonna start feeling a little bit of heat out of your heater. We're not gonna go through the full operation of the heater in this, but that's why there's heater hoses and that goes through to the heater core through the dash. That's what creates the heat in the vehicle, in case you didn't know. Right, so thermostat. Now, if you take the thermostat out, like some rain waves did back in the day, um, now, this is a general information. It may work for some vehicles, but generally what happens and can happen then is it flows too fast, okay? So if something's flowing too fast, then it just runs cold all the time, okay? Or it can overheat, so it can go either way. So some engines you're going to start it up cold in winter and if it's stuck open it's never going to warm up it's always running cold it's going to use more fuel it's like on choke you know it's all computer controlled you know more fuel etc in different settings so it needs to get to operating temperature and the same way if you've got the thermostat out when it's hot it needs to be have a controlled flow that's why when it's fully open there's a maximum size hole there they could make that bigger or smaller because it flows too fast it's not in this cooling system, in this radiator here, long enough to take the heat out of it, right? So it needs to be there long enough to cool it down. So don't take thermostats out. Now, if your vehicle overheats, and it's one of these vehicles, I'll go a little bit specific on this vehicle for a minute. If, it's, if this engine here is overheating, it's probably not your thermostat, okay? Now, it could be wrong. I see quite a few of these, and um, I've seen probably one vehicle where it's running a couple of degrees warm, and maybe one or two vehicles that are running a few degrees cold, right? I'll say thermostat problem straight away because they don't overheat, there's no other issues. It's all controlled by the thermostat. Now, there's an engine fan there. Let's talk about that as well, okay? So there's an engine fan. Engine fan, what's that? That's this fan in here. You can't, can't see it from where you are. It's about listening. It doesn't matter about pictures at the moment, you know? Man, man, man. It doesn't matter about the picture, right? Just concentrate. The fan's down there where I just showed you, right? So engine fan, what's the fan's job? What's this fan's job? It is its job to pull the air through the radiator and the cooling system and for the condenser and whatever, but it's not its job at 100 k's an hour or 80 k's an hour, right? It might be, look, those viscous fans, they do different things at different temperatures and all sorts of things. We won't get into too much detail on that, but generally its job is to keep things cool at idle or in traffic. So if you're in city traffic, you stop, you park, you're at a set of lights, that's when that fan's gonna pull the air through and keep everything cooling, okay? So if you're, well, I'll give a bit more information before we go into specifics, but, so that's on this vehicle and any other vehicle with an engine fan. Now, a lot of vehicles don't have the engine fan here, so, and I'll just quickly add on this fan shroud here for the same reason as what we're talking about airflow here. That's why there's a shroud and it connects to the outside perimeter of the radiator and it comes all the way into the fan to suck the air through the radiator, right? If that shroud wasn't there, it's gonna pull a bit of air, but it's gonna be a bit average. It's probably, I don't, I don't know percentages if it's gonna be half as good or whatever, but it's gonna be very average. So don't take this off and get rid of it because you don't need it. 
Same as this. I mean, you know, you might think it's just the trim and it gets dirty and they want to clean it, but the thing is, it's all part of sealing up the system so that when you have got these channels at the front here, that the air pushes through the cooling system, the radiator and that, and doesn't just come out the top here and then just go above everything and not do anything. So it's important that all the design trims and everything are left in position from what the manufacturer designed and put there. Now, with people having problems with engines, let's just go touch quickly on the crack piston thing, you know? Uh, what do you reckon you might? There's a lot of contributors, right? We've already talked in other videos about what the contributors and prevention and stuff like that, but it's also heat's an issue, okay? Just think about it, think it through, right? Do you reckon heat might have something to do with it? Do you reckon putting ARB bull bars and fog lights and everything, stopping the airflow, getting the ducts that direct the air through the cooling system, not having sufficient cooling might have something to do with it? Do you think the new engine, it might be better? Well, it's only four years old, so we don't know, because nobody heard of a cracked piston when, in these when they were four years old, so don't hold your breath. But new design piston, they possibly may be better, but it's still just a small engine. And why do you think the newer vehicle's got a bigger grill and more airflow? Do you reckon they might have figured out they need a bit more? And you putting bad design bull bars ain't gonna help the situation. So it depends whether you want reliability or tough, and we've talked about bull bars and whether you need one or not in other videos. It definitely varies on your specific circumstances, but you know what? Um, some people need them, some people don't. And you just gotta be careful of the design. And I think manufacturers need to re-look at their designs and get moving, we're into 2020 now. Something that looks a bit better, things that are more secure, stronger, lighter, and with the airflow that we need. I know it's a hard one, but that's your job, guys. You got the piece of paper, you're the engineers, now go for it, there's room to improve. So cooling system, what we're talking about. So you got your fan, so all the components we've covered, right? The engine's making the heat, the radiator's cooling it down, the thermostat is controlling the flow, the water pump's pumping the coolant, and the fan is got it covered for when we're stopped in traffic. So hopefully if you've got all the basic components in mind, you can figure out using a bit of common or uncommon sense what your problem is. Now in this engine, the thermostat's located over this side, down at the other end of this radio hose, down behind it. It's quite difficult to get to, it's a bit of a pain. Um, but luckily, these thermostats usually don't cause problems. I'll say never, but it's not never, it's pretty close to never. Um, so lucky we don't have to get and change those too often. Your best bet is to get all your airbox and everything out of the way because you're gonna to need to get, it's quite fiddly to get to. Definitely airbox out. Yep, that's the airbox. Let's have a look over there. Airbox, you know the airbox over there, yep. So back up here a little bit again. Um, so cooling system, we've got all our components. Of course, it's connected up by hoses. We're not gonna call that a component of the cooling system really. Um, so the deal is the engine's making the heat, the radiator's cooling it down. So you're driving along at 100 k's, if the vehicle's overheating, okay, it's most likely nothing to do with your fan, okay, nothing to do with it, okay, so you can eliminate that, okay, now, traditionally, one of the biggest causes, so we'll go with some decades of experience here, so not specifically this vehicle, but it's going to relate to most vehicles, traditionally, the biggest cause of engines overheating is blocked radiators. Now when we say blocked radiators, yeah, the radiator, this bit here, you know those, not fins, what do we call them? Tubes that go across, they get blocked up because what do we say, they're only one or two or a few millimetres wide anyway, right? So it doesn't take much of a build up of scum. Think about a dirty pond of water sitting there, you know, how you get that growth and whatever. Well, similar sort of thing and you get rust and corrosion and whatever. Now, when you use quality materials for components like Toyota do, and quality coolant, you don't get any of that. So with this vehicle, so back to specific on this vehicle and these vehicles and Toyotas in general, I'll say, I'll go as far as to say Camrys, Corollas, whatever, it's not gonna be the cooling system. If you've got nice, clean, red, pink coolant, you've been doing regular changes, as we've talked about in other videos, and I'll just touch on it, it's really important. Now this stuff's really good. The first coolant change is by the books 160,000 Ks and that could be after a number of years. And I don't have a problem with that because all the materials are new and clean and nobody's messed with it as long as people don't put the wrong coolants in there. And these are some of the problems you can have. So if nobody's put the wrong coolants in there and it's all nice and clean the way it should be, it's all good to do it the first time at 160. As I've said, I'll bring it back to 150 and we do the big front engine job, the time about water pump and all that. And you know, we've got a kit for that. So hit me up if you want one of those. Now, 160 the first time, no problemo. After that, I recommend you do it every 
couple of years. I'll do mine every year or two. Coolants are much cheaper insurance than risking all these components we've talked about from rust, corrosion, into your heater core, which includes, you know, dash working behind the dash and whatever, if your heater core rust corrodes or leaks and that sort of thing, okay? But your most important one is probably your radiator, but it also stops rust and corrosion in your engine, your water pump, you know, Welsh plugs and all sorts of things, which can be a lot of engines in behind transmissions if they start leaking. You're creating a big job, lots of repairs for not making sure you've got clean coolant. So I want to say it really clearly and concisely, one of your most important things is keeping your coolant clean and after that initial change, do it every couple of years. Just you, look, don't put water in there. You don't know what water's coming out of your tap. It could have contaminants in it. If it's already clean, just take the plugs out, let it drain, and refill it. No water needed, okay? If someone's messed it up and it's a big mess, then you want to use your recommended cleaners and water and flush the bugger out of it. And then use compressed air to blow it all out and get all any, you know, anything left out and then refill it. I suggest with these Toyotas, use genuine coolant. Um, you can't really go, if we all use genuine coolant, then we know what we're using, we're not gonna have any mixes. So I'm on the genuine side of that one for those reasons. Now, I'm pretty sure the Penrite stuff's compatible and it's basically the same stuff if you mix it right again with proper distilled water, if you've got your own quality filter system. We've got like a, you know, thousand dollar water treatment system, any water we use or flush with, you know, it's treated water so there's no contaminants in there. So you wanna just make sure you're not adding, or you're gonna cause a problem. So. Okay, so my coolant's clean. So if your coolant's clean, you haven't got any build-up, it's not going to be your radiator. It's not going to be inside your radiator causing your overheating because it's just going to be clear. Believe me, I've seen enough inside these radios and cooling systems and, you know, with ones you think they're overheating, like the old 1KZs, the gauge sort of sits on about a third. And here's some more information. As I said, it could be any vehicle here. But 1KZ, it sits on about a third, right? It's like a, almost a two-stage gauge or thermostat. I'm not sure exactly what it is but I can tell you what happens with the gauge they sit on about a third most of the time when it's cool and then once you really start working it you know I'll say I use this term a bit up the Pentland Hills or something like that There's some other hills around you know the Adelaide Hills or whatever there's hills every state's got the hills you know the ones um, then it goes up to about half okay now and even above half they actually start it's like this th the temperature gauge stops working I think they've got a, some little setting in there, a diode or something that makes it not move so that you don't panic and go into your Toyota dealer because diesels make heat. We said that at the start. They make a lot of heat and you can get into it on the gas and in probably one minute you could have gone up, I won't say 10, at least 5 to 8 degrees within a minute sort of going up a hill just on the gas. Your EGTs are going up. Don't worry about those because you can look at your coolant temperature on your scan gauge because you've all got something like a scan gauge, haven't you? Because I've highly recommended that in a number of videos for a number of reasons I'm not going to go into here. You can watch those videos and find out why. I'm not plugging scan gauge. You don't have to have a scan gauge. You get an EDS or an app on your phone. I don't care what brand. It's what I'm talking about is being able to read the data, read codes and clear codes. Now, back on topic. So, the radiator's clean, right? So you're saying get on with it, spit it out. We are, we do it in detail. This is the long version, sorry. So everything's clean. You haven't got any build up inside the system. Your thermostat, based on averages, is going to be working right. And it's probably going to be working right. Have a look at it. Does it idle at 83? When you drive it, does it kind of easily go up to about 85, 86? Yeah, that's normal. When it's really hot and you're going up a hill, you're going to see it go towards 90. How do you know that? You're reading your EDS, 70 bucks, right? Whatever. Or your app off, whatever app you got it on and your little bluetooth dongle for 40 bucks off ebay whatever it is right you're reading your temperatures and you're going right this all looks normal to me but then on really hot days it gets hotter there's probably nothing wrong there's nothing you can do about that that's what i'm trying to point out here's okay if you're sitting in traffic right and it's getting hotter then maybe there's an issue with your fan now i say it's still very rare on these you can read all these these fan hubs, I've never had to do it, okay? So you can read all about it, or you can Google it and read about people telling you what's got to be done or what you've got to do every, you don't got to do any of it, okay? I don't do it, I don't see these overheating, the fan hubs still work. I'd suggest if the fan's that old and it's not working right and it's re-oiling, it's one of those things, it's time for a new one. Just go and buy a new one, and put a new one on there, right? Genuine, of course. Not that cheap Chinese one on eBay, sorry. Sorry guys, genuine parts, right? You brought a Toyota, you want to keep the feeling, it's done 300,000 Ks and you're not sure if it's overheating a bit at idle, go and spend the money, buy yourself a new fan hub. You know, while you're doing all the court and you got it all pulled apart, unbolt the fan from the hub and change it over. Piece of cake, right? That's the way you do it, in my opinion. You can do the oil thing if you want. That's not what I would do. 
We don't see problems with these hand hubs. I just want to be clear about that. We don't see that. When I say we don't see, see a lot of Prados, we don't see the problem. It's not a big problem, okay, based on average. It doesn't mean you're not going to have one or someone isn't right that there's needed or it was low on oil or high on oil or whatever. So, so you're in traffic, right, and it's overheating. It could be a fan-related issue, but I don't think so. These are more likely to overheat when you're driving them and when you're working them, okay? There's the important part. We're talking about this vehicle here specifically. Now, these vehicles, this engine, 1KD FTV, but it's probably similar in a lot of other vehicles these days. But this one, more likely to overheat when you're driving it. When you're working it, when you're towing on hot days, that's when it's going to overheat. That doesn't mean your thermostat stop working, okay? Doesn't mean your fan stop working, it doesn't mean your water pump stop working, and it doesn't mean your radiator stop working. What it probably means is your radiator wasn't working that well in the first place for those important reasons we covered in the first place. Air flow, right? And externally cleaning it and stuff like that, which we've talked about in other videos. It's really important to have that clear airflow and it's really important that it's clean. Now, the other factors that you might not have thought of. Now, when you put bigger tires on, when you run flat tires or you know more aggressive tires that have got a higher rolling resistance, then you're creating more load on the engine. So if you've got 33s or 34, whatever you're doing to your engine, you're killing it. The original design was, you know, whatever they may be in this case, you know, probably 31s and stuff like that. Now, gearing it up by putting bigger tires on, you're making it work harder straight away. Think about dropping back a gear. I always say this anyway, in this five-speed auto, in these five-speed autos, Drive in fourth because you generally get better economy anyway. Until you're travelling at higher speed, you're not going to sit there revving at 3,000 revs. So you're going to do what you got to do even if you're paying for fuel. If you don't know what I'm talking about here, watch those videos because the scan tool shows that using less fuel, revving at 2,500, 3,000 revs in fourth. In the 1GD as well, the six speed, same thing. It shows the same data. So go figure, right? So what's causing the overheating? It's probably just airflow. It's working. You've got 40 degree air outside. It's really hot. Um... Have you got an ECU tune or a remap or something like that? That's not going to be helpful either. You really want, if you want reliability and you don't want problems, you've got to really work towards having a lot of these things in their standard form and making sure they're working in peak performance, right? So if there was an issue with this vehicle getting hot, for example, first thing I would look at is cleaning the cooling system and the airflow. Now, if it's really bad, replacing the radiator might fix your problem because the whole core is caked with mud, but then You've got to get it out and analyse it, clean it and see, do you think that's the problem? There's been a number of vehicles where we've cleaned the external part of the radiator and look, this is where all the bugs, dirt, all the debris, dirt, bugs, wasps, you know, all your small bugs and that, they just jams in between. And it's like a wall. Instead of a flow, it's like a wall. The air doesn't flow through there and if it can't get through that condenser there, back down to the condenser, right? If it can't get through that condenser that down here, right? It can't get through to the radiator. You're not getting any flow to your radiator. So there's a good chance that, you know, that's why it's overheating or getting, even if it's not overheat, overheating, even in cooler conditions, it could be working harder and not running as cool as it should. So not ideal. Um, and of course, so the bigger tires, the roof racks, you've got your swags up there. The faster you go, the harder you're working these engines. So the killer on these, I've mentioned it in other videos, I think we've pretty well covered what we're going to say, but, you know, the killer is you've got this big four drive. It's big, it's heavy. This thing, you know, on an average day, as I said before, it's about 2,800 kilos. Um, other vehicles, more or less, you know, there's plenty running around out there that are three ton plus. They're loaded up. They've got all the gear. It's nice and heavy. They've reduced that airflow by, you know, stuff all over the front, you know, and the redesigning with the, you know, bull bars and stuff. And the stuff on the roof rack creating a lot of resistance. It's working hard. It's making a lot of heat. And this is detrimental to the longevity of the vehicle. The standard vehicle without any of the mods, that engine is going to last longer, okay? So obviously, they're just tough engines and they're going to last forever anyway, subject to certain maintenance, etc. Um, so it doesn't really matter that much. But if you're chasing an overheating problem, I hope this has helped you. It could be to do with the external side of things on the radiator. It could be to do with all the bigger tires you're making it work harder, hotter weather, um, if you want to check the thermostat, as I said, you just plug in a scan tool and you can see if it's idling at 83, drive it, watch it go up. If it, if it, look, it can get more complicated than this, right? Okay, so if your coolant, your cooling system's clean, you're going to have the flow, you're probably wasting your time pulling the radiator out, getting that clean, you're going to find that it was 
you know, when they go, oh, it was 7 or 10 or 15% blocked, that's not going to be it. It's going to make a small difference. Um, it's when they say it was 70% blocked, they're the ones, but we don't see that anymore. That was the old cars. Average coolants, coolant mixes, not enough coolant, um, qu poor quality materials used and used to get the rust and corrosion, all the mess. Manufacturing, swarf and things, blocking things up, not good. So radiator, not going to happen. Thermostat, not going to happen. Fan, not going to happen. Basically, that's probably why these don't overheat. That's what I'm here to tell you, they don't overheat. So if it does, I hope you've got a better understanding of the cooling system so you know where to look. But I wouldn't be thinking it's the thermostat initially. Um, again, if it's, got, if it's a thermostat sitting there idling, you're going to see an issue. So if you see an issue at idle, check that. 83 degrees, right? If it's sitting on 87 at idle, mate, you've got a problem, right? Okay, you've got a problem, change the thermostat, absolutely. That's how you're going to diagnose your thermostat. 83, let's go to 84, 83 to 84, that's it. Any more than 84, look, don't get me wrong, see this is, it's a hard one, okay? So I've seen one that I will say 85, 86, but it's just opening at a slightly higher temperature. It's not meant to, it says 83 on it, but it's opening a couple of degrees hotter, but once it opens, it doesn't matter because you've got the same flow anyway, if you know what I mean. Once it's opening at 86, and it's got the airflow, so the vehicle doesn't overheat. It just idles a bit warmer, but it doesn't overheat, right? Because once you get to, say, 88, the thing's full open, full flow, so it doesn't really matter. It's just your idle temp's a little bit out. So I hope you understand that. I don't know what else I can tell you, guys. That's your cooling system. Um, in older cars, you know, they had a spring on one side of the hoses and that that used to rust out as well, and then the hoses would suck in and stuff like that. But these engines don't have any of those sorts of issues or springs in the hoses. So it's not any of your hoses. Of course... One of your main reasons that I haven't mentioned yet, which I would seem, I would think is obvious why it would overheat, which is probably why I haven't gone there yet, and we're going to go there last, is your coolant level. Your coolant level, of course, if you've got no coolant, you've got air in there, it's going to overheat. So, sorry if I didn't mention that at the start, but that would just seem so obvious. Make sure your coolant level is at the correct level, right? So with the engine switched off cold, it's going to be around about the full line. Notice where the full line is. So if you've got coolant or fluid or whatever's in there, as long as it's at the full line, happy days. Now, if you've got water and rust in there, that's probably part of your problem, okay? You shouldn't have let that happen. Then you're probably going to want to replace your radiator, your thermostat, your water pump, every component, because it's an absolute mess in there. You want to do a lot of cleaning, get some of the right products and put in there and help clean and stop that from going any further and get the right coolant in there. Now, when we say coolant, let's talk about the word coolant because it's a bit dodgy, right? It's a bit of a dodgy word, coolant, because coolant ain't coolant, is it, right? Let's have a look. Here it is, right? Let's have a look. What do we got here? This is what we use in all the 1KDs, right? And it's good stuff and it's ready to go, right? 50-50 premix super long life coolant. There it is, it calls it coolant. So it's a bit confusing because it would lead you to believe that it's going to keep your engine cool. Well, guess what? It ain't going to keep your engine cool, okay? Its job isn't to keep the engine cool. Now, there is possibly certain things in there that help um, it from freezing, okay? So once it goes below a certain temperature to avoid freezing and maybe to not boil, and it does say that actually, here you go, ready to use, anti-boil, anti-freeze, corrosion inhibitor. So they're your three main purposes, so why call it coolant? Because coolant, it's a bit misleading, isn't it? You make and think it's going to keep cooler, do I need to change a coolant? Well, hang on, no, because it doesn't do anything. This is what it does. It stops the fluid from boiling, it stops the fluid from freezing, only to certain temperatures, right? But well within the climates here in Australia, that's for sure. In other countries, you guys that are watching, might be different for you. You need to do some research for your particular area, and that all depends on the, the mix, right? So you you know, if you're going to use the local stuff, if your Toyota dealer in your country is not a big ripper, I'm sure they make the right mix and product for you guys. And corrosion inhibitor. That's the key thing here, right? Because this ain't going to boil, and it ain't going to freeze in most conditions. The key thing here is corrosion inhibitor. The corrosion inhibitor is your insurance to protect all your components and keep them working in peak operating condition, okay? Let's get rid of that. That's what it's about. It's called preventative maintenance, okay? You don't wait till there's a problem. You're not saving money by not doing the work. You're just gonna cost yourself more money later. And if it's not you, oh, I'll just sell it. You're just putting it on someone else, right? So, you know, karma sorts that out. You need to look after things. 
because otherwise, you know, farming it off to someone else, it's not going to work out for you in the long term, okay? So, coolant isn't coolant, you know, oils ain't oils, coolant ain't coolant, right? It's corrosion inhibitor, it's antifreeze and anti-boil. The key thing we want is corrosion inhibitor. For all the reasons we talked about, keep it clean like new. That thermostat down there is going to be working perfectly, and when you take it out, I'm going to go grab one for you, actually. Give me one, one, won't take long, 10 seconds, and I've got one to show you. got a couple here right now these have been sitting out in the weather for a couple of years but I want to show you what an old thermostat a grubby old thermostat looks like right there it is right so with clean coolant that's what it's going to look like it's just going to come out and it's you know it's in clean normal fully operating condition this one says 82 degrees on it so there you go so maybe they say 82 or 80, whatever they say I don't really care what they say that they all the ones I see they all idle at 83 so 82 probably gives a reading of about 83 at the sensor and the scan tool or whatever, right? It's all good. By keeping it clean, everything's in peak condition. The inside of your radiator, it's clear that fluid can flow and do the job it was designed to do. The water pump, everything's there, it's intact. It can pump the coolant. Everything works cleanly and smoothly the way it was designed. So if all that's right and it's all clean, why is it overheating? Well, you've either got a leak and if you've got a leak, You've probably let the wrong person work on the vehicle, okay? Um, I don't know, if someone's done something, they've taken these, this hose and these clamps off and they don't like these clamps, probably because they butchered them, and they put a hose clamp on there and maybe they've over-tightened the hose and it's butchered up the hose and it looks ugly anyway, because that's why they come out with these clamps, right? It's, it's idiot-proof, okay? It can't be over-under-tightened, it's just right, right? So when someone put a clamp, they over-tighten it, they damage the hose and then from all the heating and cooling, heating and cooling, heating and cooling, then eventually the hose rips next to the clamp and then you lose a bit of coolant and then, because there's no other leaks on those, these don't leak coolant, okay? Water pumps, very slow leak. Your coolant level's not gonna drop slowly over time, it's more of a mess. The radiator's very slow as well, right? So I'm yet to see one of these with a genuine cooling system leak that hasn't been caused by someone. All your slow leaks is you just your water pump, your radiator, nothing else. Let me think that through. Nothing else that someone hasn't touched and made happen. Both those leaks very slow. Um, more information in another video. So, so yeah, I just kept going, didn't I? So there's your coolant, that's covered. So what you know, these don't overheat. So the only thing left, if we know that the thermostat's running at normal temperature and it's working and you're driving and it goes up nicely and all that, and that's cool. But then some days only on hot days it gets really hot. And we know that the fan, it's not in traffic, so it's not the fan. Or if it's in traffic and you're getting hot, well, then you get out and do it, run on an 80K zone and it's fine. But then as soon as you stop in traffic and it's hot, then it's probably fan related. Yeah, makes sense. Think about it. That's what I'm here for. So you've got to stick to the end and listen because, you know, we're going to go over and over again a few. But you know what? I didn't learn this in half an hour, an hour either, right? So if you get an hour out of me, be happy you got the hour because bada bing, see? Like I said, the karma will sort that out. Now... This is the deal, right? If you do the 80Ks and it's running beautiful, it's sitting on 86 and you're happy, whatever. Again, Australian temperatures. Um, it's on 86, no dramas. And then you come to traffic and you stop and it goes 87, 88, 89. You've probably got a problem here with a fan. It's not spinning, it's not pulling any air. You're not getting any airflow. That's why it's getting hotter. It doesn't happen in these, but if it happens, that's what will be happening, right? Because that's its job in traffic, okay? Now, if it's the opposite way around, which is it should be, you slow down. Remember what we said, the engine makes the heat. If you stop at the lights, the engine's not making any heat. It's just sitting there idling. Popping into neutral is the best thing you can do, right? Take the load off the transmission. Better for the transmission, better for the cooling system, better for everything, right? Once you stop there, just remember to put it in drive before you hit the gas and drive off, right? Don't do it. If you're not good at this stuff, don't do it. Just leave it in drive. Do whatever you want. I'm just giving you tips on things you can do to make it even better. You come to a stop and it cools down, beautiful. You know your thermostat's probably working right, your fan's working right, happy days. If it's when you're traveling at speed that you think your temperature's getting higher, you need to be able to read the numbers, not just look at the gauge. Forget about gauges, they're a guide. It's like those sight glasses on the battery going off topic for a second. Don't even look at those, okay? You know, put a bit of tape over it because they probably don't work, not half the time, but you know, 
there's a high percentage of the time they're wrong, they're not quite right, whatever. They're a guy, they're a good idea, gimmicky thing, but you know what? They'll show you it's okay when it's not, and they'll show you it's crook when it's fine. Yeah, anyway, mate, we're talking about cooling system, not batteries. Sorry about that, guys, we were interrupted by a phone call. It was good timing, too, because, again, off-topic, batteries. Anyway, cooling system, I hope... I've explained all the basics, how it all works, how important the coolant and the airflow is, that it's clean coolant, the airflow's there, when you're going to be able to pick if your fan's a problem, stopped in traffic, thermostats are rarely a problem, Th radiators used to be a problem but not if the cooling system's clean, if your cooling system is gunk then it's probably going to be radiator but I wouldn't rule out anything else either because of the gunk, it just stops thermostats from opening, closing, working right, they jam right and the biggest thing is your radiator that is your biggest thing the flow to the radiator okay so that's really important the flow to the radiator so I want to go back to what I mentioned at the start about airflow you need to do everything if you've got a if you're towing a caravan and you've got a modified full drive well it's a recipe for a disaster if you've got all these mods bull bars lights and everything and it's hot change the whole redesign of the front of the vehicle and you're doing a lot of heavy towing that's probably one of your big contributors airflow cooling Okay, you really need to think about what you've got in front of the vehicle that's stopping that airflow and you need to do what you can to increase it. So if you've got an ARB bull bar, check out what k has got. If they've got that um, under tray replacement, I'm going to do the same thing. That can direct some air up to the cooling system because that's going to be a big plus and add some uh, cooling up there. And um, if they haven't, let's ask them, hey, are you going to make one? I think you need it, obviously, on, on all the ARB bull bars, probably. Particularly, you know, the 120 and the 150 Prado is about all we care about a lot because that's what we see and work on and whatever. But look, same deal. Maybe it's something ARB can do as well. ARB could just come out standard with a bit more airflow. They could have some more slots cut into the front of these bull bars, you know. Isn't it CNC and whatever? It's going to be easy to program up some slots that get cut in there and those trays underneath there with some slots and some bends so that you know it, it funnels and maybe some channeling in behind the bull bar that just channels that air i know you know you're the engineers and you got it all worked out but if toyota i think they're bigger and better than you by the way i'll just put that out there and if they came out with those plastic trims at the side to channel and funnel it and same with other manufacturers they're the big successful manufacturers if they came out with that don't you think it needs it and it's meant to be there, right? Otherwise they wouldn't do it, okay? And you might say, oh, we haven't had any problems. That's the usual answer from many. Oh, we haven't had any problems yet. Oh, we haven't had any problems. Well, you know what? It's hard to relate that problem to a cracked piston, for example, right? So, you know, it could be all caused by RV bull bars. There you go. Have a think about that. Do that as part of your survey when you're looking around. How many engines that have had a failure, whether it's a Ranger or whatever, right, because it happens in them too. A lot of small diesel engines, like I said, big four wheel drive, heavy brick wind resistance, bigger tyres, you're making it work hard, you've blocked all your airflow. How many four wheel drive small diesels in big four wheel drives have had failure that had a bull bar on the front of it? I'll leave you with that thought. Hope you appreciate all that time, and I am out of here. Bada bing, bada boom, subscribe. See you, mate.